M61, Black Beauty, 2. Before long, the dogs began their yo, yo, oh, oh, again, and back they came all together at full speed, making straight for our meadow at the part where the high bank and hedge overhang the brook. Now we shall see the hare, said my mother. And just then a hare, wild with fright, rushed by and made for the woods. On came the dogs. They burst over the bank, leaped the stream, and came dashing across the field followed by the huntsmen. Six or eight men leaped their horses clean over, close upon the dogs. The hare tried to get through the fence. It was too thick, and she turned sharp round to make for the road, but it was too late. The dogs were upon her with their wild cries. We heard one shriek, and that was the end of her. One of the huntsmen rode up and whipped off the dogs, who would soon have torn her to pieces. He held her up by the leg, torn and bleeding, and all the gentlemen seemed well pleased. As for me, I was so astonished that I did not at first see what was going on by the brook. But when I did look, there was a sad sight. Two fine horses were down. One was struggling in the stream, and the other was groaning on the grass. One of the riders was getting out of the water covered with mud. The other lay quite still. His neck is broken, said my mother. And serve him right, too, said one of the colts. I thought the same, but my mother did not join with us. Well, no, she said, you must not say that, but though I am an old horse and have seen and heard a great deal, I never yet could make out why men are so fond of this sport. They often hurt themselves, often spoil good horses, and tear up the fields and all for a hare or a fox or a stag, that they could get more easily some other way. But we are only horses and don't know. While my mother was saying this, we stood and looked on. Many of the riders had gone to the young man, but my master, who had been watching what was going on, was the first to raise him. His head fell back and his arms hung down, and everyone looked very serious. There was no noise now. Even the dogs were quiet, and seemed to know that something was wrong. They carried him to our master's house. I heard afterward that it was young George Gordon, the squire's only son, a fine, tall young man, and the pride of his family. There was now riding off in all directions to the doctors, to the farriers, and no doubt to Squire Gordon's, to let him know about his son. When Mr. Bond, the farrier, came to look at the black horse that lay groaning on the grass, he felt him all over and shook his head. One of his legs was broken. Then someone ran to our master's house and came back with a gun. Presently there was a loud bang and a dreadful shriek, and then all was still. The black horse moved no more. My mother seemed much troubled. She said she had known that horse for years, and that his name was Rob Roy. He was a good horse, and there was no vice in him. She never would go to that part of the field afterward. Not many days after, we heard the church bell tolling for a long time, and looking over the gate, we saw a long, strange black coach that was covered with black cloth and was drawn by black horses. After that came another, and another, and another, and all were black, while the bell kept tolling, tolling. They were carrying young Gordon to the churchyard to bury him. He would never ride again. What they did with Rob Roy I never knew, but t'was all for one little hair. Bertwick Park
At this time, I used to stand in the stable, and my coat was brushed every day till it shone like a rook's wing. It was early in May when there came a man from Squire Gordon's who took me away to the hall. My master said, Goodbye, Darkey. Be a good horse, and always do your best. I could not say goodbye, so I put my nose into his hand. He patted me kindly, and I left my first home. As I lived some years with Squire Gordon, I may as well tell something about the place. Squire Gordon's park skirted the village of Birtwick. It was entered by a large iron gate at which stood the first lodge and then you trotted along on a smooth road between clumps of large old trees, then another lodge and another gate which brought you to the house and the gardens. Beyond this lay the home paddock, the old orchard, and the stables. There was accommodation for many horses and carriages, but I need only describe the stable into which I was taken. This was very roomy, with four good stalls. A large swinging window opened into the yard, which made it pleasant and airy. The first stall was a large square one, shut in behind with a wooden gate. The others were common stalls, good stalls, but not nearly so large. It had a low rack for hay and a low manger for corn. It was called a loose box because the horse that was put into it was not tied up, but left loose to do as he liked. It is a great thing to have a loose box. Into this fine box the groom put me. It was clean, sweet, and airy. I never was in a better box than that. And the sides were not so high but that I could see all that went on through the iron rails that were at the top. He gave me some very nice oats, he patted me, spoke kindly, and then went away. When I had eaten my corn I looked round. In the stall next to mine stood a little fat grey pony with a thick mane and tail, a very pretty head, and a pert little nose. I put my head up to the iron rails at the top of my box and said, How do you do? What is your name? He turned round as far as his halter would allow, held up his head, and said, My name is Merrylegs. I am very handsome.